All right, thank you very much. Okay, that's out of the way. Now, we are, we have been studying, studying the context of our calling in chapter five, and we're gonna end our study with that, uh, uh, that today. And what we wanna do is, as we end chapter five, we simply wanna spend our, our time today in class uh, giving some final thoughts to the context of our call. We want to look at everything that we have um, discussed in chapter 5 and um, just have a discussion uh, about what we've learned in regard to the context of our calling. And the, the way we want to begin doing that this morning, for those who have been teaching and haven't been in class the last few classes, I want to recommend and strongly suggest that you do two things. One of the things that I want to suggest that you do is please go back and look at the videos of the last few classes that we've had in regards to this subject uh, because those last few cl uh, classes are really key to understanding what we're going to be uh, finalizing, finalizing today in regards to the context of our call. And so we're going to ask if you haven't been there to, to do that. Now, uh, we ended our discussion last week, Wednesday, um, didn't go quite as smooth as I wanted wanted it to, uh, we had some technical issues, but I want to pick up uh, this morning, I showed a brief video clip uh, this past Wednesday, and I'm going to re-show that, we're going to start that now, we're going to watch this video clip, this video clip actually um, is a great illustration of what we've been trying to communicate these last two class periods about understanding what it means to uh, understanding the context of our call. We've looked at a passage of scripture in Mark chapter one, and if you haven't been in class, I want to encourage you to really look at this particular passage of scripture. Mark chapter one, verses 14 through 18 in particular, and uh, we've been looking at Jesus to provide us, we've been talking about Jesus providing us a life model of, of calling. And he teaches some really life transforming principles in this context of Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And so this video clip actually provides a, an example of what Jesus was trying to communicate to his disciples in this context. And so we're going to watch this uh, video. And as you watch the video, be sure to try to note. Uh, take notes of what it means, what it really means to live out the context of your calling as it relates to the kingdom of God. What does it really mean to live out the context of your calling in context of the kingdom of God? So that's what we're going to do. This is a really short clip. <laughs> you can see why someone might hate being a school bus driver. The early hours, when the weather sours, the abundance of responsibility combined with the absence of eyes in the back of your head. Now have a good day! Nevertheless, Curtis Jenkins loves delivering these little ones to Lake Highlands Elementary in Dallas, Texas. Yes. Emily Grunninger is the principal. He goes way beyond the outline responsibilities and duties of a bus driver. I mean, that bus is like a family. These are all my children. These are my community. I love them all. To establish community. What's your job, man? He starts by giving everyone responsibility. This is one of the police officers. It's an elaborate flow chart. She's an administrative assistant to she's the president. Administrative assistant. Yeah, she's, yeah. Everyone working together to build a yellow bus utopia. Yeah. And we're going to care about each other and we're going to love everybody, right? I put time, effort, love, care, understanding, understanding each and every one of those kids. Come on. To show his love and understanding. Hey, Chief. Curtis gives presents throughout the year. Oh, you say you like baseball. Each gift personally selected with that child in mind. Hey. He gave this girl a t-shirt. Her first book. With a picture from a book she made. I'm hoping this t-shirt inspired her to keep on writing books. Over the years, he has bought these kids bikes, 
backpacks, handed out cards on birthdays, and even turkeys at Thanksgiving. He has spent thousands out of his own pocket. And yet, if you ask the kids what they like most about Curtis, the gifts don't even come up. He really cares about us, is really kind, and he helps anyone in need. Ethan Engel is a fifth grader. It means a lot to you. Yeah. He says the bus ride is often the best part of his day. My mom got divorced when I was only four. He's the father that I always wanted. In some ways, I just, I wish my dad could have been like that. We make the mistake sometimes of thinking certain jobs are more important than others. I know. But Curtis Jenkins made his job important. And in doing so, he even created his own salary. That's the paycheck right there. If I can get that, you can keep the money. <laughs> Steve Hartman, on the road, in Dallas. Curtis Jenkins. Curtis Jenkins made his job important. Curtis Jenkins made his job important. What have we been talking about in, in chapter five? We've been talking about understanding our call. And what we've learned is that our calling is our vocation. It's the very thing that God has put in our hands. And when we look at what Jesus did in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 18, we see this, this example that he when, he, when he calls Peter and Andrew in this context, he calls them. And in, in his calling, he makes this declaration, come Peter, come Andrew, who were a fisherman of fish, I am now going to follow me and now I am going to make you a fisherman of men. Curtis Jenkins made his job. Question that we want to actually, uh, as we final thoughts today, we just want to go around the room. As we've been talking about this the last several weeks, want us to begin to kind of share, now that you've had some time to reflect. Uh, last class, we really gave you a sign. <coughs> Uh, to each one of us to consider your, your present vocation and how your present job can be used. How are you now using your present job to partner with the purpose of God? How are you using your present vocation to partner with God in His purpose? And just for clarity's sake, we know that any calling that we have that's separate and apart from the purpose of God may be a good thing at the expense of doing the right thing. Purpose and calling can only be fulfilled based on what we've learned, previous learning, is when we understand that our calling and our purpose is linked to the purpose and calling of God. And we now know that the purpose and calling of God is what? What's God's purpose? To restore and to reconcile mankind back to himself. <laughs> to restore and to reconcile mankind back to himself. And the way that we do that is what we learned in Mark chapter 1. Jesus starts, I mean Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. Jesus starts this whole conversation, pre, uh, presets this whole conversation with Peter and Andrew and the rest of the disciples by saying, don't forget this. He began preaching the kingdom of God and the gospel. Or the, and the gospel. So when we talk about calling, we must understand our calling is a kingdom lifestyle. It is to be a kingdom lifestyle. Our calling is not a system of religion. But it is a kingdom lifestyle that we are called into. As, and as such, we can begin to answer this question. How is your present vocation being used to partner with God in his purpose? All right? We see, we see Mr. Jenkins actually exemplified as a bus driver. 
as a bus driver. How he's been, he's transformed his job into a, a purposeful, a purposeful call. Okay? So let's just begin to share. Since we've been discussing this the last two to three weeks, how have you used anybody? We can we can start this conversation at any any, any particular table. Uh, how have you used your vocation now in a way to uh, partner with God in his purpose? Well, as a retiree, you know, the way I partner with Christ is by being his hands and feet, trying to uh, encourage and pray with people visiting the sick in the hospital and trying to listen to the Holy Spirit for his guiding me on a daily basis. Because once I retired, it's wide open and you can do. So you have to really listen to the Holy Spirit for him to guide you on a daily basis what you should do and who you should bless. And that's how I'm partnering with Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Anybody else? Uh, uh, Sister Day and then uh, Brother Joseph will follow. Go right ahead, Sister Day. Um, one of the things that uh, I try to strive for. Can, can we get a little more volume on that mic because we're recording? Okay. I want to make sure we can hear you. A little closer. Yeah. One of the things that I strive for as a child care, child care teacher and provider is uh, I want to see, I want the children to see the love of Christ in me. I want to be an example of his, his love. And uh, this week, my class went through a big transition. A lot of the children were promoted up to my class. And with that, it comes a lot of fear, anxiety for the little ones. And this week, I tried my best to make sure I was there in the moment uh, to make them feel comfortable so that when the parents drop them off, I was there with open arms to give them a big hug, and that means a lot to uh, the little toddlers that are just <laughs> beginning and they're, they're, they're sitting, they go through a separation anxiety with the parents, especially in the morning. But um, it really went really well to see them reach out to me after two days, reach out to me just with their arms and looking at me as if this lady is here to protect me and love me. So yeah. it's going to be good for me today. Amen. 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 Brother Joseph, go right ahead. Uh, I tried to ask you a question. Right? My job is one of dealing with student customers and external customers. But the external customers have more weeks to select them than the internal customers because they create business for us. So, which, which customers create more business for you? The external customer. Okay, okay. So I try not to judge anybody because my external customers, I hear them over the phone from I talk to people all over the US. Okay. And I try to treat them, each one of them with respect or care because if I do not do that and uh, they get a negative impression of how I come here then, it can affect the company and a long term and short term basis. So to my understanding, I try not to judge people, treat them regardless of the background, whoever, the religious affiliation. I treat everyone with respect, care, and concern because they customers are the life of the Amen. Amen. Oh, man. Anybody else? Brother Rangel, he has a mic already. Go right ahead. Well, uh, first of all, to start, you know, I want to refer to some of our early teachers. Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were asked what was our most and most desire that we want to do. And I stated that I want to be able to work with kids like in an athletic field and stuff. And then also when we talk about calling, when he calls you, you have to listen to him call. Me. And I think at, at my younger age, he was calling me because I have been involved with kids for many years through coaching track, baseball, football, and so on and so forth. But I think now at this time, I'm hearing his call. So my vocation is I'm around young children every day, mm. everywhere. Mm. So I have to listen to his calling and start uh, getting, bringing them the gospel, encouraging them in any way that I can when I see somebody that's struggling. 
Amen. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, Sister Roz Evans? No. no. Who has? Okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Sister Savoy. Okay. Um, I feel like my youth and my love sweet. To for what I started doing for years now, uh, I've been buying T-shirts with biblical uh, verses of goodwill and worship and kingdom. And my way of sharing the Bible with them is through those T-shirts, and I send them to the Philippines. And there was one family that I sent 87 T-shirts. I sent them T-shirts about Texas. About, the, uh, about what I learned in the church, and I also send Bibles. And once in a while, I make blankets with biblical verses in them to send to particular families, and then I send them my phone number so that they can call me, and that is, I feel like God is using my income to share with people from a distance what I'm learning and what that is all about. Hoping that my words, through my words, they can hear God. And through my actions, they can see Him. And when I was in the Philippines, I was able to hug a lot of these people in hope that they could also feel Him through me. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Who's it? Sister Thomas, go right here. I was just going to say when uh, I was working for the lady, uh, I don't work for her anymore, but she's always calling me to do stuff for her, even though she got other people to do it. And um, I try to go and help her as much as I can, you know. She sent me places to buy things and do things. And I feel that, you know, I'm still doing what I love to do, even though I don't get paid for it. But I still feel that, you know, I can help her in ways because she can't do anything and I can. And so I I go down and I flatter her off. I go shopping for her or whatever she needs. And so I feel like that I'm still, you know, doing something that I need to do. So I work with I work with kids, uh, primarily first gen kids and low income at risk students, 85% of my kids, that's what I have currently serve. And um, to help them get to and through college and get to school or whatever the case may be. But what I'm learning now is that I get the opportunity to help many of them are diverse with their needs to graduate from high school or you know, they're gonna be the first to go to college. So I'm helping them to reauthor some of their previous experiences so that they get to really change their family tree and change the trajectory of their lives. So helping them to reauthor some of the people to talk about some painful experiences that they have gone through or they're currently going through and feel like this is the last stop in the field. A lot of times I am the last stop in the educational system for them. So helping them to be able to really sit there and reauthor what they've gone through and help them to know that, you know, there is a future we can you get to come over and leave. And start a new chapter. Amen. Amen. We we have sister, we're gonna take two more comments, sister uh, Watson and then Sister Jackson. All right. Go ahead, Sister Watson. So I too am in the educational system with 160 students. I cannot, you know, openly vocalize my faith. Uh, so it has to be through my actions. Uh, each and every student is welcomed into my classroom with a smile. Uh, my classroom is run as a safe place. Uh, each and every child is um, sent on their way with a, a greeting of well wishes. I have several students every year that believe that they are stupid. So over the course of the year, I help them reauthor that belief and understand that um, they, they are intelligent. Um, Grades, yes, are based on how well you do an assessment. But I teach my children grades are not an indication of how intelligent you are or how good you are. That's based on your behavior and what you do. 
So my, my goal as an educator is to bring them up to a higher level of understanding, respect for themselves, and respect for those around them. Amen. Amen. Sister Jackson. Um, every day, um, I'm trying to come like what Brother Joseph uh, said, is to treat the people that I meet with dignity and respect. Um, I really deal with the least, the last, and the loss. And at my job, there are certain people that come into the office and the receptionist will say, Lynn, your, your people are here. <laughs> because they, are, they only want to speak to me. And if I'm not there, they don't want to talk to anybody else. And I had to think about that. And I think that's because I treat them, I know I treat them uh, non-judgmentally because everybody has a story, no matter where they've been. And where they've been, once you hear their story, to understand you know, what made them homeless, what made them whatever, you really uh, have compassion for these people. And uh, so sometimes they come in and especially the least and last of a boss like this past week, I was, uh, had one of my favorites. And they don't, she does not smell good. I mean, she smells horrible. And when we actually when we leave, we have to just lock, lock all everything down. But nobody else will see her, but she always wants to see me. And so, I have to really, and I know her backstory, so it's a non-judgmental uh, attitude that I have toward her. And so, she sometimes she'll come in and she'll just need to use the phone to make a phone call. Or she'll say, Lynn, I know you're not supposed to do this, can we just get a cup of coffee? <laughs> and so I'll give her a cup of coffee. And so, um, I really try to show them the love of Christ no matter what stage that they're in in their life or what's happened to them. And so um, that's how I try to partner with Jesus every day is to treat everyone non-judgmentally no matter what their story is or what has happened to them. Amen. Wonderful comments, wonderful comments. Here is the takeaway that we want to all leave chapter five understanding and I'm hoping we've accomplished this task. And that is, when we watch the video and we, we look at Mr. Jenkins, he, he makes this statement, and we see demonstrated in his life. You know the little boy that he touches? He's touched several kids, but they, they picked up on his little boy. And the little boy makes this comment, and the comment is, you know, Mr. Jenkins represents uh, to me the father that I wish I, I did have. And in that, in that statement, it capsulizes what each one of us should, I'm hopefully, the way that we should see ourselves in the context of the current vocation that we're in. Now, the only way that you're gonna see yourself in the same lens that Mr. Jenkins sees his vocation and Jesus has called us into our vocation is that we understand what it means to live a kingdom lifestyle. Notice when Jesus, before he called Andrew and, and Peter and the rest of the disciples, he says the kingdom of God is where? But in, in, in chapter 1, verse 14, he said the kingdom of, he makes the statement, the kingdom of God is, is at, at hand. Now notice, the kingdom of God is at hand. He's making a, a very telling statement when he says that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not something that you need to be looking to happen in, in some future time. But the kingdom of God is right now at hand. Therefore, repent. You won't be able to see the kingdom of God working in your life if you haven't repented. Repentance, again, means changing your paradigm about understanding who you are, who God is, and why you're here. So Jesus, after that statement, goes about demonstrating what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of, the kingdom of God is present right now. And he begins to teach them a very key principle about the kingdom of God that Brother uh, Rangel that you, that you mentioned from previous teaching. We all have to understand that the kingdom of God is where? It's in you. It's in you. 
So therefore, you represent in your calling a very strategic plan of God to partner with him in his purpose to reconcile and restore mankind back to himself. Your job is more than just a job. Yes, sir. And it's important that you repent about how you see your present job. Right. Right. Okay. We, we talked about in, in previous classes that we learned that every, no job is more important than another job. So have you begin to evaluate your, your present situation right now as being unimportant? Have you made that switch in chapter 5? That in regards to the way that you may have saw your, your, your job before chapter 5, but right now as we go on, you see your job in such a way that you see it now in a way that you may have never seen it before. And the thing that you need to see that Mr. Jenkins actually demonstrated so profoundly is this. You need to know that you are God to man in this world. That's why Jesus says it's important for you to understand that the kingdom is in you. You are, in fact, God to man in this world. Jenkins became the father that this man didn't have. He became the presence of God to this little boy. God designed that this man be a school bus driver. By the way, which is those who work in the school system know <laughs> school bus drivers probably have the most, most difficult, you, you're talking about challenge of a job. You, you get on the school bus one day. Yeah. Just ride the school bus one day. I, I, I hear the conversations from APs uh, all, I mean, every day in terms of referrals that are lined up based on what happened after school in terms of what happened on the school bus. It can, it can be considered one of the most challenging jobs. Not only one of the most challenging jobs, but one of the most thankless jobs. One of the most unpaid jobs that a person can have. But when you understand the kingdom of God, notice what Jesus said to, to, to uh, notice what Jesus says to Peter and Andrew about what he will do and what the kingdom of God is designed to do. I'm going to take you from being a fisherman of fish and make you a fisherman of Men, what, what is Jesus really saying in that statement? What he's saying is, when you understand God in you, God transforms the natural of what you're doing in, into a supernatural way. What you, what you would have been deemed as unimportant by the world all, all of a sudden now becomes important. You begin to operate in your life on a level that begins to supersede and begins to actually uh, work in, a, in, in, in such a way that it draws attention, not to necessarily to yourself, but to the acts that you are carrying out in your life in terms of connecting and, and restoring other people's lives. And how do you do that? by being God to man. Sister Jackson Jobs is one of the most famous jobs, you know what? What she's demonstrated to a lady who come in, comes into the office who, 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 who body odor, nobody, nobody else wants to serve this, this, this lady. She comes in and will, will tolerate what others will not are not willing to tolerate. And in doing so, she becomes God to that woman. That's right, that's right. Yes, sir. Each one of us, in, in our own unique way, has been called to do the same thing where you are right now. Amen. 
And oftentimes what we, what we vision in terms of wanting to do with our lives, we have not made the connection between the context of where I am right now is what God is actually providing for me to do. Connecting, we talked about in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 11, connecting the vision of, of my heart with what he's put in my, my hand. Brother Rangel shared in his story, he's always had a, an affinity to work with kids. Always. That's what God has put in his heart. Now, in his present vocation, however, if he doesn't have a, a kingdom perspective, he can, he can be pursuing thinking that he's not he is not in a place to fulfill what God has put in his heart in his present vocation because he thinks he may, he, he may be thinking on a he may be thinking that he has to be doing something else right now in order to do that. And in doing that, he missed, he missed right now the ability to fulfill already what God has put in his heart by, by, by utilizing what God has put in his hand. He can, he's already in a position to really fulfill what God has put in his heart. What's your present occupation right now, Brother, brother uh, Randell? He is, the, he, is, he, is a, he is a custodian, uh, custodian maintenance supervisor over all of Wiley High School. How many kids do you come in contact with every day, Brother, brother, uh, brother Randell? 1,200. 1,200 students every day. Watch this. He, he comes in contact with 1,200 students every day. Every day. But yet, if you look at your, you, if you look at that, that particular vocation as being unimportant, what happens is, and he has this desire to work with kids and athletics and that type of thing, he may, he may see his present situation as being unconnected to what is in his heart. And yet, the very thing that's in his heart is he's exposed to every day. How many athletes do you come across uh, every day, brother? Brother, brother Miguel? Uh, 300. 300 athletes every day. And actually, he's able to touch. I just know. I just know a little bit more, and I know brother, brother Miguel. He loves all sports. He's able to come in contact with students, athletes, every day. And because of what he does, and the way he does what he does, he's able to have a profound impact on doing the very thing that God has put in his heart in terms of wanting to do. But you couldn't do that without really him. It's the life. Write this down as we leave chapter 5. I am God to man in the earth. I am, I am God to man in the earth. I am, yes. Uh, we was over in the area of First Indian and Brother Kuhn. Kuhn and his mother was really having a pretty argument. And she was walking down the road crying. She was standing in the yard screaming. And uh, we was right in the middle of it. So we called him over and we prayed with him right there on the spot. And uh, I think that. He just kind of walked out, but I think they let him know that we actually him. Amen. That leads me to the last thought that I want us to consider as we go from chapter 5 and I mean and to chapter 6. When we look at what Jesus did with his life, and we're going to continue to explore his life as our life model and all of these things, 
one of the things that Jesus did and be looking for those who made this switch in terms of seeing your now present vocation from a kingdom perspective. Here's what will happen. We've been being taught about think souls, right? Now we know that what we are in our vocation is partnering with God. There will be, now notice, Jesus didn't, he had multitudes following him. Did he not, as he went along? Not all of the, not all of the multitudes became disciples. And we're going to be speaking more about this. But there will be those that are drawn to him. Right. Right. And those that are drawn to him are the ones that God has been intentional about in terms of reconnecting and restoring. Right. I'm saying that to say to you, he's provided us a model. When you make this switch, be looking for the moment in time. It won't be everybody. And notice what was said earlier by a comment. Jesus wasn't preaching. Like we have come to, it's not a system of religion. He was living a lifestyle right. that drew people to him. And we're going to talk about personal power uh, later in our, in our, our, as we go along. It's your personal power that draws people to God. And Jesus, be looking for the moment in time when one or two individuals who will come to you and it will be so clear that what God wants you to do with that family or that, that individual, that person needs to be taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> That's not everybody. But it will be in that moment there will be an individual, selective individual, who because of you being God to them in that moment, it'll be like Jesus meeting a woman at the well in that moment, that you'll know that this more than anything else is about this person, uh, me being there to teach this person the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, all right, uh, as we close, Go to chapter 6, and we're going to be begin reading, I mean, begin studying chapter 6 on Wednesday. This is going to be a, this is going to be a really a fascinating uh, study, too. It's going to be the context of your claim, the importance of the context of your claim as it relates to leading to God's purpose in your life. Amen. We, we, let's get ready to worship.